It's been estimated that at present in Devon there are about 20,000 buildings with thatched roofs and a core of only 100 thatchers. Many of these thatchers, in fact about 90% of them, are men of over 50 years of age. And with a shortage of young men coming into the industry, there's a very real danger that this ancient craft might eventually die. And it's here that the Rural Industries Bureau has stepped into the picture with a new apprenticeship scheme to attract the right young men into this ancient craft. Well, I've come today to meet the chairman of the committee that looks after rural industries in Devon, Mr. Peter Sutcliffe. Mr. Sutcliffe, how will this apprenticeship scheme work? Well, anybody who's interested in becoming an apprentice should apply to one of the two rural industries organizers in Devon. It will be found at the county hall and they will try to marry up the applicant with a master thatcher in the county. Presumably there'll have to be a strict limit on the intake. There will, yes. It's partly conditioned by the amount of money we have available from the Rural Industries Bureau and partly the difficulty of finding master thatchers who are willing to take apprentices. be a Thatcher's Association in Devon, but unfortunately it's lapsed. I would very much like to see it revived, and our organisers are working on an, on an attempt to get it revived. I think this is important because traditionally all the material for thatching used to come from Devon's own fields uh, when it was uh, hub when the corn was harvested in the normal way. Now we have combine harvesters which mash up the straw, so it's no good for thatch. Uh, we have to import materials from uh, Holland and from East Anglia, and this is where an association would be of the greatest benefit to thatchers. Excuse me, Mr. Emmett, could I have a word with you, please? Mr. Emmett, what makes a good thatcher? Well, that's hard to say. What things do you have to know? Well, the knowledge, the knowledge of, uh, of roofs, to how to tackle each job separately. Every roof has got to be tackled differently, you see? Is it sufficient just to be a thatcher, or do you have to know other jobs as well? Oh yes, you have to be. You got to be part carpenter, part plumber, part mason, or dressing lead round chimneys, or set round chimneys, or if you got to re-roof, re-timber roof, where something broke. So you have to be a jack of all trades. Oh yes. How did you come into the thatching business yourself? Well, the only son and. And the downs from gen third generation just had to do as I was told, no, no choice. What do you think of this apprenticeship scheme? Very good, providing you could get the, the right, right apprentice. And if you could be selecting yourself, to make a lot of difference. If a lad does take to this work and can put up with the difficult weather conditions, is there a good future in it? Oh, I think so. Yes, I think so. Thank you very much.
You've been, how long have you been a Thatcher, Bob? Nearly 30 years. And you're pretty rare because the, this kind of reed bed is, is pretty obsolete now. Uh, you don't get yeah, many Thatchers yeah. with their own beds. Not in, not in Devon, uh, hardly in the West Country. Uh, cut with sickle, mostly cut with a uh, machine now. We can't get a machine in there because of the water, see? It's the same pattern, it's uh, arenas, called arenas, same as Norfolk reed, but it's got a different colour because of the sea. See, there's yeah. salt water and fresh water in here, which uh, makes the, uh, the blend different, see? You'll find it's the russet colour. That's right, uh, yeah. uh, from the Norfolk Broad, you'll get it on the black and brown side, whereas you don't near the coast, see? But, well, how many other kinds of reed are there, Bob? Has well, there's, uh, you know, there's uh, rye, rye, and uh, thatch with rye, and then there's the, um, you can thatch with um, wheat and spring reed, and, uh, and then there's the winter autumn sown reeds, which, you know, varies in uh, varieties of seeds, like the old varieties, like um, Victor, Red Standard, Squared Master, and then there's the new seeds out now, which is Flamingo and uh, Capel, these no, are all grown no, commercially now for, for no, thatching, are well, they? Well, not really for thatching, a lot of it, no, it's, it's well, they're grown for the top of the wheat as well, you know. Yeah. But a lot of the, you see, the, the wheat, wheat today isn't much capture. Yeah, so y your family's all right. Well, there's some... another boy as well, there's three, you know, three in the, yeah. Uh, and uh, you're trying to get a young fella into it now, like getting interested, but um, they don't like too much hard grass, see. Is there enough thatching in the southwest to keep you going? Well, yeah, I travel anywhere where there's a job, see? I mean, yeah. if anybody can't get a thatcher, some, some don't know where to get a thatcher, see? So, um, you're know, always in work. I've never been out. I mean, it's uh, good to keep working all the time, isn't it? So your son's got nothing to worry nothing about. Nothing to worry about. As long as he produce good work, I think you're all right.
The harvesters shake down what the wind hasn't, the way they have in this area for hundreds of years. But all is not what it seems. When apple growers meet in Taunton tonight, they'll be told that they must make a united stand to persuade cider makers not to use imported apple concentrate instead of locally grown apples. What we've done in the past, we tend to meet, uh, tend to have met the cider manufacturers individually, and they have said to us, "Well, we'd like to do it, but we can't because our competitors uh, won't do the same, and they'll undercut us by using cheaper imported apple concentrate." So what we need to do is to get the whole industry together, on our side, all the growers together, on their side, all the manufacturers together, and see if we can get something worked out. Cider apple growers haven't had the confidence to go ahead and plant orchards because they're not sure from year to year whether there'll be a market for the apples which they're producing. Turn it the other way around and say local apples aren't available, we've got no option. So this meeting of uh, cider apple producers tonight then is, is just a waste of time? No, we welcome it. We're glad to see that they're interested in planting cider apples again. So you're Great saying news. that anyone out there who might be thinking of planting up an orchard to your requirements, mm -hmm. please do it, we'll buy. If he has the right land and the right know-how, and we have the right varieties for him, we may well consider him for planting. You may well, I mean, yes. but you can't set up a new venture on the strength of may well, can It's you? a very specialist job. It's not suitable to everyone. If you've been in dairy farming, a switch to fruit farming is not the easiest thing overnight. Some growers find themselves with a foot in each camp. They're part of a shrinking business supplying a growing thirst for cider, and so they're well placed to see what needs to be done. I would hope, first of all, to shake up the farmers in much the same way as the girls are shaking the trees this evening, so that they do really understand what the facts of the industry are, because it's very difficult for farmers in the little, their small farms dotted around the country to know the overall picture. And then I would hope that they would agree that we should get together with the manufacturers, look at the facts, and sit down sensibly and quietly and negotiate an agreement whereby the future of this industry, which after all has gone on for a thousand years nearly, can continue in the next millennium efficiently and not under any form of protectionism. After every gale, you can see more trees down and how many farmers replant them, rarely if ever. So gradually the orchards of Devon and Somerset, are, the old traditional orchards of Devon and Somerset are disappearing. The cider making season has started rolling amidst controversy over illegal trading. The specialist cider farmers in the southwest believe the Italians are flooding the market with cheap concentrated apple juice. They claim it's being made from surplus eating apples already paid for and rotting on an EEC apple mountain. Now the farmers fear the big cider makers are cashing in at the expense of homegrown produce and putting at risk the skills and traditions of the small producers using age-old methods of cider making. It's very hard for the traditional cider makers, those that buy their local apples and try to pay a reasonable price, they all have to compete in the same market, large and small. The consumer wants a range of tastes and the local farmhouse cider makers certainly cater for one particular taste. And it's very hard for them to compete if the major cider makers, or other cider makers for that matter, are importing juice at a much lower price because any manufacturer faced by a low raw material cost has an advantage, surely. Cider making old or new is big business. We spend £400 million a year on cider and its byproducts. Cattle feed is even produced from the leftovers. 600 farmers in the southwest are contracted to grow the special apples needed by the Taunton Cider Company. When harvests are low, the tonnage is supplemented with apple juice from France. The company dismisses claims that Italian juice is also being used. I wish they'd get their facts right. You can't actually do that. Uh, the EC regulations forbid it. You're in a situation where you've got an apple mountain, you've got surplus fruit requirements, and we're talking about eating apples, not cider fruit to start with. And in that case, where you've got a surplus, and it's called intervention fruit, you would actually have to sell that at market prices. So it, selling at market prices means that, from our point of view, it's far too expensive to buy anyway. But what the farmers are actually saying is they are doing it illegally, and that's what they're having well, investigated. Well, they've got to police their own industry, haven't they? If that's the case, we know nothing about it. That's something they've got to sort out with the EEC within the agricultural system. Nothing to do with us.
That's exactly what the farmers are doing, but they want more. A pledge from the big cider makers not to use cut price imports and not to tamper with traditions. On the farm we have uh, approximately 21,000 laying poultry and uh, 3,000 to 6,000 growers, all depending on the time of year. Here on this place, we've been here now six years and uh, we started with one house, which was the then a wire floor house at the bottom. And uh, this house held somewhere about 6,000 birds. And from then on, we've built uh, several hatch units. Uh, the first one was put up at 3,600 and then an extension the next 12 months was put on with another 3,600 giving a total of 7,2. Uh, the following year we went on with a full 7,200 unit which brings us uh, roughly now to the 21,000 which we have today. The, this, this farm was uh, a dairy farm and the buildings have been adapted to poultry the shippen, uh, the petitions in the shippen have been taken out and our own designed uh, cooler cage has been put in there and um, 
the small barn which at one time had a small pound in for cider making was taken out and this building has been adapted for the same sort of cooler cage and uh, the small buildings around the yard have been used for rearing uh, this is with Caligas tear brooders uh, which accommodate 3,000 these are put through roughly every 12 weeks and the birds are then shifted into the cooler cages after three weeks and are taken through to approximately 16 weeks when they are moved to their laying quarters either to the um, hatch batteries or the Californian cages at the bottom. The cooler cages, which is um, a timbered cage we built on the farm, these were uh, was designed, I designed this through going to a show in London and seeing something very similar. These we have used now for the last six years and we found them as good as anything I think we could buy. Um, they're quite labour saving. They're normally stocked at 100 per tier when the, bird, the chicks are moved from the brooders and after six weeks they are thinned out to 60 per tier and then they stay at this 60 until they reach the age of 16 weeks when they are transferred to the laying quarters. The cleaning is done uh, of the uh, cooler cage by uh, an ordinary shovel, um, scraper, and this is done manually. Uh, the droppings are reasonably dry and are put into a normal Howard spreader, which are, is taken out onto the farm or neighbouring fields and uh, spread in the normal fashion. You bought this farm in 1972. Is this just before or just after the prices started going through the roof? Well, they were reasonable at that time. Um, I paid 14 and a half for 60 acres of well, rather wet ground like this. But in about six months later, they were going to cost me 30 odd. Was there ever a time during those early years when you felt like packing it all up? Well, there was only one time when one would have really thought about packing it in. Was uh, I went to Taunton Market about two months after I came to the farm here and bought six cows. The one accredited and five non-accredited cows. I brought them back to the oaks here and decided that now I was on my way milking cows. And uh, the following morning I got up and one of the cows was pretty sick. And the next morning I got up, the first cow that I'd actually purchased was dead and had to be pulled out of the shed. At that particular time I wondered whether I was going to pursue it. We often hear about the comradeship of farmers working together. What sort of neighbours and what sort of help did you get from them in the early days? Now, this is an exceptional circumstance. Uh, we had farmed at Cheriton Fitzpain and I had always supposed that we had good neighbours down there and I, I, I still believe we did. But the neighbours that I have around me here were really exceptional. At those stages, I, I only had a, a little grey Fergie tractor, which, well, wouldn't hardly do the work on a 20-acre holding, let, let alone a 60. And I only had to ask certain neighbours, and up came a tractor, and 
without these sort of things and without a fairly steady stream of reasonable young lads ready to help me, uh, that's the sort of thing I think would have made me fail rather than uh, lack of personal confidence. Every year, it seems, we're told that it's never been harder for young people to make that break on their own into farming. What are your own feelings about this? There must be the opportunities, but of course, I believe today that you certainly would need 30,000 and that you would probably need a part-time job for certainly two years uh, and maybe even a caravan dwelling. Championships, Assen, 1990, gold medal, 100 metres. What are you going to do now then? We've got about an hour to get to the train, I think so. 